G'day AAMCA, we're here with Mike Lynch, uh, Professor of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University, um, talking about his research. So Mike, what, what, what were and what are the ethnomethodological studies of science? Uh, well, there's two different ways you can approach that. One is that uh, in the 1970s, um, Harold Garfinkel mm -hmm. um, initiated a program that he called Studies of Work. Uh, she sometimes appended that with studies of work in the sciences and professions. But mm. um, the studies of science were part of that larger program. Mm. And the initial slogan was um, uh, that existing studies of work in occupational sociology, sociology of music, sociology of religion, um, sociology of science, um, were uh, characterized by a missing what, mm. which meant uh, that they would study all aspects of music, religion, science, um, you know, oc occupations of all sorts, uh, without going into the details of what people did as part of their day's work. Right. Um, and this is, uh, you know, there's understandable reasons why sociologists didn't do that. I mm. mean, there were interests in, um, you know, workers' attitudes, workers' uh, preoccupations outside work, uh, where they came from culturally in the class system, where they ended up. Um, and it was presupposed that, uh, you know, uh, in the sciences, the specialized sciences have their own methodologies. Mm. In music, there's a whole pedagogy of music and uh, a whole notation and things of that sort. And and so it didn't seem relevant for sociology to be uh, one encroaching upon the um, the work that were, was already provided for, sometimes formally, sometimes informally, usually in both ways. Mm. But um, given the interest in ethnomethodology to uh, look into the uh, interactional production and the embodied production of uh, the scenes, the uh, routines, the uh, you know, built-up organizations that we associate with with uh, work, play, routine events, recurrent organizational affairs, hmm. that um, there was a relevance to looking at uh, how musicians coordinate their activities, how scientists uh, work through the contingencies of an experiment, um, uh, what an observation uh, involves as uh, you know an extraction of meaningful uh, elements from a scene from mm. a, a, a complex environment and so uh, a number of us started on topics uh, such as Eric Livingston um, looking into how to demonstrate uh, how a proof is produced mm. not just in, in formal mathematical terms but as you actually work through it or as it's uh, detailed on a blackboard, and um, uh, I took up uh, a study for my dissertation on mm -hmm. <clears throat> a biology lab uh, where they were doing some studies of uh, um, the anatomical and physiological organization of uh, recovery from injury using mm -hmm. rats, and uh, I spent quite a lot of time with um, so a team of electron microscopists trying to uh, reconstruct and observe in real time how they uh, put together exhibits of um, this phenomenon of how brains recover from injury and, mm. um, and how they talk about it, how they deal with uh, the discrimination between features that they can count tentatively as um, you know, part of the phenomena versus as uh, introduced through um, artifacts or laboratory mm -hmm. practices and I wrote my dissertation on that topic of art and artifact as I called it and a few years later that was published as a book. Now that was one line of work mm -hmm. uh, in which ethnomethodology was relevant to science studies but there was another um, uh, that developed sort of internally to this field of science studies or science technology mm -hmm. studies uh, that was uh, undergoing a kind of a shift at the time um, in the 1970s where um, previously um, Robert Merton, his students, and uh, people had studied uh, sociometric networks in the sciences, uh, kind of reconstruct the outlines of fields, were um, 
displaced gradually by a movement that called itself the strong program in sociology and then later um, the um, sociology of scientific knowledge and finally scientist and technology studies tends to be the name for it these days. Mm -hmm. um, that involved people like David Bloor, Barry Barnes, Harry Collins, um, and a little bit later um, Bruno Latour, Steve Wolgar, and a number of others. And their work was variously um, influenced by Garfinkel's programmatic writings, and mm -hmm. they were very interested in uh, what they often called interpretive flexibility of how even something like a formal statement could be uh, treated as uh, open to various interpretations. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, uh, and so there, there was this idea of social construction taking hold at that time. And Garfinkel was one of the several sources that were consulted for that, um, mainly as a literary source rather than, um, mm -hmm. you know, somebody was actively involved in that. So we had this sort of two, two streams of uh, ethnomethodological studies of work and the uh, largely located around Garfinkel and some of his students at UCLA and I was at UC Irvine. Uh, and then this other group largely located in England, although it, it became international uh, mm -hmm. fairly quickly that uh, um, really became quite um, uh, well known, quite uh, established, and that's the science and technology studies in which uh, ethnomethodology was uh, one of quite a few sources that were drawn upon, but rather abstractly, and in ways that uh, certainly Garfinkel and uh, those of us who are kind of close to his version of things found to be um, dubious in mm -hmm. certain mm -hmm. respects. Mm -hmm. So in the um, ethnomethodological studies of work of science, mm -hmm. um, the, what, what sorts of uh, 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 things did you find and, and contributions were you able to make um, in terms of the, the, the science itself and, and or um, back to ethnomethodology and the things you found out about um, okay. members' work? Well, um, you know, some of this is looking at it in hindsight. Hindsight is uh, when I was doing the initial phase of research, uh, I was interested in, um, you know, some fairly specialized topics, uh, um, uh, particularly uh, interested in how, uh, at a cutting edge of science, you could observe um, discriminations being made um, in a very practical way, sort of mm -hmm. tentative solutions to the problem of reality. What, what is it that is being investigated in a novel domain mm. that can hold up uh, intersubjectively, um, get established as fact, get um, you know, published and stabilized in that sort of way. And that, as a general matter, that was of interest to a number of people in the science studies field as well as ethnomethodology. Mm -hmm. I was drawing not only on Garfinkel, but uh, Melvin Polner's work on mundane reason and um, uh, reality disjunctures mm -hmm. where he worked it out through going to the courts mainly and also looking into um, psychiatric uh, encounters between um, uh, people being uh, treated treated for insanity and their physicians or nurses and whatnot or family members where um, the um, sent the, uh, the the version of reality whether it was uh, in a traffic court where the cop says you were going um, um, you know, 60 miles an hour and you say we're going 40, well that gets worked out in kind of mundane ways, but there's at least initially this uh, reality, this juncture, and similarly mm. the, a person who is uh, suspected of uh, being delusional um, or having hallucinations, there's also this sense of resolving a you know single mundane world in the face of multiple accounts of it. And um, I thought that uh, you could look at it historically or um, I, I prefer to do it in contemporary ways where you've got mm. people working with instruments that show unusual configurations of things, uh, you know, it's called it invisible things, making them visible, mm. um, that this would create uh, circumstances in which um, it had to be worked out whether, whether this uh, novel sense of things was to be uh, mapped into the world as we otherwise know it or as, as a spe specialized field otherwise um, maps it out. And um, so I, I found that to be a kind of what Garfinkel later called a perspicuous setting mm -hmm. for um, <clears throat> um, 
you know, encountering that problem in a very highly circumscribed way rather than as a philosophical problem and to see what sort of practical solutions were d dealt with to deal with that. Um, that uh, kind of worked its way into a number of streams of work in social studies of science. One had to do with laboratory ethnographies where mm -hmm. um, you know, quite big claims were made, um, particularly by Latour and Woolgar and also Karen Borsatina about uh, how scientific uh, work, facts, theories, evidence, empirical uh, phenomena were uh, constructed all the way down, right? That it wasn't as though there were theories constructed or um, hypotheses that were constructed and then empirical evidence that would bear upon them and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, support them or not, uh, but that the, the idea that in fact itself uh, the um, um, very material reality that was that is worked on in laboratories is already subjected to lots of artificial purification and reformulation, and that uh, it's then kind of talked about, argued about, negotiated into being a stable product after undergoing you know various uh, trials of strength, as Latour called it. Uh, I didn't buy into quite that uh, level of discourse, although I was interested in uh, sort of suspending uh, mm -hmm. and almost as a matter of necessity into suspending belief in whether they were right about what they were saying was uh, at stake in their work or not, uh, and, and looking at how they dealt with it uh, without necessarily um, resorting to the kinds of formulaic solutions that were available in philosophy of science. So I think my work is probably a little more ambiguous in its uh, you know, resolution of the problem of reality that others were more willing to um, uh, you know, line up on this idea mm. of constructivism, which uh, turned out to be very provocative, you know, touching off arguments with philosophers and then somewhat later with scientists. Uh, the second line of work was, has to do with visualization. Um, and um, actually that, that kind of work is uh, again quite prominent in the field and uh, by visualization I don't mean just depicting things but um, bringing things into visibility uh, uh, through inter instrumental mediation and also a lot of work on preparing materials to be made visible and mm -hmm. also uh, um, sub uh, transforming them or working with them in such a way as to enable measurement, enable mathematization comparison. And uh, just to give you an example, um, in a number of biological fields, uh, various types of gel electrophoresis are used. Now to do that, of course, you have to extract um, bodily material, pre-purify it so that if you're looking at uh, DNA or um, you know, a, a particular chemical sample, you have to extract that, um, do some work with it to you know, remove uh, other chemical constituents uh, and then run it through a gel apparatus with electricity, use various transformations to um, but to photograph it. And um, in some ways that's a very artificial way to work with materials, but what it gives you is uh, um, comparative um, you know, lanes in a gel and some of the older methods that allow for identification, elimination of samples that might seem to be the same. Um, um, it's of course used in forensics, which was one of the things I eventually started working on. Um, and so um, visualization then has to do with that idea of rendering materials so mm -hmm. that they become tractable to analysis. And in some ways it is analysis, but in, it, it also precedes analysis. and. It's, it, it's the production of data rather than just the um, um, uh, measurement of data or the um, interpretation of data. It's like, uh, and, and of course judgments are involved, um, sometimes built into computer programs, sometimes done in a kind of more point-by-point uh, -point way or case-by-case -case way, which uh, involves you know, making decisions about what data to count, what data not to count, what, when it's adequate, when it's not, and that's establishing a field that then later will be part of the publication, part of the graph mm. that um, um, is, is uh, published or, uh, or not. <laughs>
on file to develop statistical analyses. <clears throat> in some ways, um, actually at this conference I mentioned this, uh, it's, it's qu quite closely aligned with what Garfinkel did in some of his earlier studies on uh, sociological pro projects like um, the, the work that uh, his graduate students did to um, code uh, interviews, mm -hmm. uh, recorded interviews in terms of a set number of categories um, developed by, uh, I think it was Bale's analytical categories that would uh, give you a you know, finite list of uh, types of action that could be imagined to occur in interaction so that when you hear a dialogue on tape you would then code it in terms mm -hmm. of those and that's when he came up with his list of ad hoc practices. Uh, the most famous of which is the etc. clause that uh, um, you have a rule of how to specify something into a code, but in order to make it work with you know in a changing sample of materials, you have to have an etc. clause that extend, it, which is that you judgmentally extend what you've done thus far to other examples like it, but without being able to specify what would or would not be exactly like it and. Uh, for sociologists, that, of course, was um, a source of uncertainty, a source of unreliability or potential unreliability, and they worry about it, but for ethnomethodology, it was actually a constitutive phenomenon where um, without that et cetera clause, the work would be stopped in its tracks, and so mm -hmm. it was a way of getting the work, the work done. Not that, it tells you, not that it tells you exactly how in detail it got done, but it's a way of alluding to that it gets done in detail. Of course, uh, many studies since then have um, explored and examined, uh, uh, you know, the kind of case by case judgment or um, uh, the, the the kind of case by case production of uh, routine events where mm. that kind of work gets done. Absolutely fascinating, Mike. Thank you very much for your time. Okay.